joined us. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning. Today is February 8th, 2023. Uh, welcome to the V3 implementation call. Uh, if you have not already done so, please remember to update your name and your affiliation, especially for the vendors. Uh, this is how we track your attendance. Uh, during the V3 implementation calls. It's super important to make sure you can do that. If you're only able to connect on the phone and your phone number will show, please just go ahead and send us a note that that was your phone number and your name and affiliation with that. And uh, we will make sure you get credit for attending. Um, these meetings are recorded and shared on the NEMSIS website and the NEMSIS YouTube channel. So feel free to share with your team or review as needed. Um, we encourage participation, um, being able to have back and forth and hearing thoughts and receiving questions and being able to take it back to the team for consideration later is really what makes this project so successful. Um, so please feel free to speak up. If you have the questions, somebody else probably on this call also has the question. Um, and I will just remind that we've had a uh, Quite a few people join in the last minute. Please don't forget to update your name and affiliation uh, on the um, meeting so that we can give you proper credit for attending. Um, let's go ahead and get started today uh, with the maintenance update, which uh, I am going to give you. Maintenance will be February 21st to 22nd. Uh, there will be some interruption, but it should be very minimal. Uh, you may not even notice. So on February 21st or 22nd, if you have a interruption, try again. If you still do, please contact us and we'll let you know if we're still in our maintenance window. Um, and if there's any questions on maintenance, always please feel free to reach out and ask uh, questions. You can open up a help desk ticket or you can just email me directly. Um, Lori, let's go ahead and switch to you. Sounds good. Thanks, Jen. And I'm going to share my screen here. We have started this new tradition where we introduce a stakeholder on each call. And really the purpose of this is just to learn something about your, your coworkers and colleagues that you may just see a name or hear a voice from and to build points of connection that we hope will lead to collaboration and just to have a little fun together as well. So the person we're introducing today really enjoys reading, bowling, petting their cats, and watching movies. And something interesting about them, they have been a hostess and a server at a restaurant, worked at a gas station as a checker and a full-serve attendant, and they also have worked with EMS for over 20 years. When asked what they like most about their job, they said they like that it can really make a difference. It may take a while, but having an impact on care given during someone's worst time is important, which I think is a good, good reminder for all of us. Does anyone have any guesses? If you do, you can write a name in chat. If you think you may know who we're talking about. I feel like the full service gas station is a dead giveaway because there's only like a few states that even still have that, right? Ooh, yeah. I think, is it New Jersey? Do they do that? New Jersey, California, maybe? I think Oregon has full service, don't they? Maybe. We do. All right. It's our very own Jen Korea. <laughs> and Jen joined the TAC a little over a year. Guys, it been a year, Jen? It has been. A little over a year as a business data analyst. And we are so excited to have her. And she shared some pictures of her cats and her grandkids um, with us today. So thanks for sharing, Jen. Yeah. And then I also have um, just a couple of quick announcements. I know we have not had any states turn green since the last call, but last time some people asked for kind of an update of who we know that's close to turning green or just close to submitting records in 3-5. And we have a list here. I know Connecticut, um, California, New York, Florida, North Carolina, Alabama, Nevada, Vermont, Delaware, and DC are either very close or have recently submitted their first records. So we're hoping by the next call, we'll have some more states to turn green. 
And you can always check on state pages. Jen's going to mention this as well, where to find this information. But we have recently updated transition plans for states, which can be found on their state page, as well as in a spreadsheet for vendors that Jen will talk about. And then finally, just a reminder, next Friday, February 17th, is really the, the push for 2022 records. And our list is shrinking here of states that we're still working with. And I've been in touch with all these states. I know they're actively um, working on some issues to make sure we get 2022 records in time. So thank you for your help, vendors and states. And then I also had a question recently I wanted to address here for everyone, and that is, should we bother to submit 2022 records after February 17th or not? And the question or the answer there is yes, we, we do want to continue to receive your records, even if they don't come by that deadline. That is the deadline when we will cut off um, and stop receiving records for the publicly released state data set for 2022. And that is important because it's shared literally with hundreds of researchers every year, um, and it's kind of a static data set that won't change. But the records that we receive after that will still be included in the cube. They will be included in our warehouse and in dashboards. So yes, keep sending those records, but we hope to have as complete of a data set um, by next Friday as possible. So thank you for that. Any questions? All right, I will pass it back to you, Jen, thanks. Thank you. And we are going to go right to Monet, who is going to talk a little bit about the 2023 annual meeting, which I know is everyone's favorite. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jen. Can you see my screen okay? Fantastic. Greetings, everyone. I know that you're all waiting for this information, so I'm happy to provide the dates for the next annual meeting. Those dates are August, uh, sorry, Monday, August the 21st through Friday, August the 25th. You'll see that we have heard your um, comments about um, the length of the meeting is too short. Um, we're rushing through topics. And so we're giving you a full week. Um, my next slide is gonna show us a little bit more about what that week will look like. So day one, Monday that 21st is a travel day. We no longer want you to travel on the weekends. Um, we would like you to try and use this Monday as an opportunity strictly for travel. And this is gonna be intended for the boot campers and the advisory board members or anyone else who wants to travel in early. So we're calling this like a pre-conference uh, pre -conference attendees. We actually may change the name of the session called boot camp, but for now we're calling you boot campers. Day two, um, that Tuesday is when we will start the meetings for the boot camp and the advisory board meetings. And we are suggesting that this day will be a travel day for the full, full conference or full meeting attendees. Days uh, three, which is Wednesday, we'll have all of our general sessions as well as on Friday, or sorry, Thursday. And then on Friday, we're um, allocating this as a travel day as well. The next slide, I wanna tell you a little bit about, um, so we are working on the agenda. I am currently working on the registration link for both the um, NEMSIS, registration process as well as the registration for the uh, venue. Um, and so those details will be provided in the next coming months. Um, we do have a new venue. Um, it's in a walkable community, the restaurant shopping um, at trails, there's the Olympic Park, they're abundantly available within this area. Within six or seven minutes uh, drive to the Olympic Park, um, and the restaurants and everything is just within walking distance from the, from the venue. The venue is called the New Park Resort and Hotel. And here's a link, or you can simply Google New Park. It's in the Park City area. Um, these are the details that I have for you now. And I'm just asking, please go ahead and save this date. Put it on your calendar. I know that there is a lot of competition for conferences 
But this annual meeting, the NEMSIS meeting, if you really want to understand the NEMSIS standard, if you want to have those connections with your, um, with attack, with our leadership at NETSA, with um, your vendors, this is the best opportunity for um, engagement with um, the stakeholders and understanding the NEMSIS standard. And if you have any questions or need any additional information, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to anyone else on the TAC team. Um, we are really working hard to address all the concerns or the majority of the concerns um, that you have addressed in previous um, evaluations. Okay, and that's enough out of me. Thanks so much. Are there any questions? Oh, I saw something in the chat about bowling. I will look for a bowling alley. If that's what you want, you know, I'm here to please. So if you need a bowling alley, I will try and find one. But for now, we have all type of activities planned for this full week of the annual meeting. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Jen. And, and, those, and those dates are 821 through 825 of August. So, and I just want to give a big shout out to Monet. Thank you. I know you do a lot of work putting this together and and it looks like I it looks like a great new place, a great new venue. And Jen, um, someone in the chat asked if there will be a virtual option. Thank you for that excellent question. At this time, I do not have the details completely um, in place for what the virtual option will look like. There may be some type of virtual presentation, but it will not be the full extent of what we did last year. So my... I, I would encourage anyone who wants to really understand the, the standard and what we're doing to make changes um, with a standard, please try and come in person. If you um, are having some financial struggles, please reach out. We are here to help you. Um, the, the virtual experience will not be the same as the in-person experience. I can tell you that for certain but we will work to provide some type of virtual option for those who absolutely cannot attend. Um, but I don't have any additional details about what that will look like or what the cost is at this time. Yeah, Monet, and this is Clay. Maybe just had a couple of comments about the venue. So this is a really great venue. It's a fairly new hotel and it's in, um, uh, uh, Kimball Junction. So you may remember if you've traveled up to our meetings before, uh, Kimball Junction was right off of the freeway before you made the turn to head into Park City. So the value of this venue change and kind of why we did it is for additional space uh, to ensure that we uh, could perhaps have a few more folks attending in person this time and, and having plenty of room to spread out. It's, it, it's a much shorter commute from the airport. I don't know, it's probably 20 minutes um, uh, from the airport to the uh, to the hotel. And the Olympic Park is very close. So we'll be uh, planning on, um, uh, there's mountain tubing, there's gonna be some zip line options. And so we'll have, we'll have some fun, um, uh, some fun plans in place. So I think, I think this will be easier to get to. It'll be a bigger venue. And the fact that um, grocery stores are walkable, lots of shopping, lots of, of restaurants are within a minute, right, of where you'll be, um, a great area. I think this will be a great uh, new venue to try. Yep. Clay, Clay, you can keep ignoring the primary question, but that's the one in chat, which is, what about bacon? <laughs> well, yeah, that's going to be an issue. I don't know, Monet. Um, 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 I will look in. for someone who's going to provide delicious bacon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're catering in, so we'll find a bacon specialist. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the additional um, input as well, Clay. Thank you. All right, Jen, that's enough out of me. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so I am next up on the agenda, and I am going to share my screen. And um, one of the things that we are asked about uh, regularly is, oops, sorry. Um, 
is the different resources that are available on the uh, nemsis.org website and where things are found. Um, so we thought we'd real quick go through that as well again. One of the places people don't automatically think to look when they are not a vendor or, or developer is under the technical resources, but there are quite a few things that you might find helpful under the technical resources. Um, there are the defined lists, there are custom element library, the data dictionaries are under here, guides and usage is under here, and this is a really great um, place to come and see the get information. Um, UUID questions, there's a guide right here that was written. Custom elements, how to develop them, checklists, flow chart, best practice guide. Um, we worked on those last year with all of your input, the vendors, um, every stakeholder uh, got to have some input on the on the guides that were developed. Pertinent negatives and not values. We always get questions when you're setting up schematron rules about how pertinent negatives work, how not values work. What are the different data sets? So those guides are now available. So there's a lot of information under the technical resources that's not just for technical folks. Um, the compliance, uh, compliance software testing status, this is another page that a lot of state data managers might find useful. Um, is right here under technical resources, and you can click over. Um, also, one of the um, places that we have is under this using EMS data, V350 revision, and you've got a list of 3.5 resources. We've talked about this um, quite a bit over the last year. Uh, one of the things to point out is that we had a slight name change here for version 350 element summary. And this is the document that has the tabs of the V35 elements um, compared to 340, what's new in 350, what are state data set elements. Um, you can also find the value changes from 340 to 350. And we have added an additional tab now that has the new version 350 elements and what the new values within those dropdowns are. So you might find that useful. And then if you keep going down below, um, especially state data managers that are working on developing their own tools, you may want to wonder what Arizona or Georgia or Kansas has put out for their folks to utilize. And you can come down below and see what the different states have put out. So anything that's down here below the national lists were contributed by your, your state data managers uh, for you to look at. Another good resource is, and I'm actually going to, sorry, when I have the Zoom thing at the top, I'm not quite as good at navigating. So one of the things that we have um, done last month in January is sent out a survey to all the state data managers, and we have updated the state data pages down here on their implementation timelines. So anyone who responded, you'll notice that they have the last date that they responded and the information that goes along with it. Um, and also available is the state and vendor transition plan that has been updated. And as requested, a couple of new columns have been added the last day that each of the states or territories will be accepting version 340, and then the last updated. So when we got an update um, from the state and when it was included here is also available. Um, for state data managers wondering what different vendors are doing, there is a tab here. Uh, anyone who's in compliance testing will be listed. A not applicable means they may not be developing or that particular product does not have that type of um, uh, compliance. So the ESO EMS repository is not a collect and send product, so that's not applicable, but they are in compliance testing for the receiving process. 
So that's how to look. And of course, as always, you can go to the Nemesis software compliance page that I just showed you and look for this as well. Are there any questions about resources or does anyone want to know where to find something or, and I'm gonna look at the chat, chat really quick. Hey Jen. Yes. This is uh, Amber in Colorado. Hey Amber. Um, I just want to mention, this has come up a few times and I think has caused confusion for, for vendors. Um, and I think it's just semantics and the way we talk about um, transitioning to version 3.5. Um, so for example, in Colorado, we still accept 3.4 records. However, all of our agencies are required to send 3.5 data as of January 1st of this year. So I think this causes confusion because while we'll still accept 3.4, the requirement is actually 3.5. And I think it's it's just different the way that, you know, you all maybe talk about this transition and what we do in the state. So if they're still sending us 3.4 data, they're technically out of compliance with our state rules. Um, so I don't, I don't know if there's like a better way to capture that or if other states have run into this. I'm just kind of putting it out there that it has caused some confusion as we try to communicate with vendors about our transition. Do that make any sense? So I know you guys are live with 3.5 and you'll still accept 3.4, but you require your agencies to submit in 3.5? Yeah, so three five is the requirement. Though we're not, we're not turning away three four records. But if you're still sending us three four records, you're not compliant with with rules. And that would definitely probably be something that needs to to you know, if there's any questions, reach out to your state data managers. I feel like there should be some clarity on this spreadsheet in that case, right? Like if we if we were to look at Colorado on this spreadsheet, um, there's a TVD date on the drop dead date for a three four, right? Okay. And we know that statutory, uh, that's not right. That's just technically how long they can they can keep it. They can accept it rather. Right. Yeah, exactly. I feel like maybe there's a column just because we talk about it in different ways. Like we don't talk about the last day to accept. We talk about here's when you need to transition by. So, you know, like the three, five transition time frame is like, oh, when we're going to be ready to start accepting it. Um, but maybe it's like a drop dead must transition by date or something. Again, I'm not sure other states have run into this, but I just wanted to share. I think it does lend itself to some confusion in these conversations. And I think that's where the communication with the between the vendors and the and the different states is is going to be key. Um, it would be pretty hard to track every nuance that's included for each of the different states on a spreadsheet. I mean, so I definitely think that's something that um, what we tried to do here uh, with this column was ask the different state data managers, like, when are you cutting off 3-4? When are you no longer going to take that record? And that's what's in the column here. Yeah, but we may never do that. And that, again, that's what's that's not what's important in our, like, regulatory lens. It's also not that important for us and our customers, respectfully, like, we don't care when it's when when she's going to stop taking it. Um, we care most when um, the organizations are required to move. I mean, can we just add a column? I can take that back to the team, and we can talk about it. Um, so we will we'll get back to you. Yeah, Jen, just. To make sure, I'm sure we're understanding this, right? I mean, for Colorado, perhaps instead of TBD, right? It could just um, we could could have some some kind of an indication that just indicates they don't have a hard date, right? They're not. No, 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 no. Because 
she could put December 2025 as far as we care. Um, but the real number or real date we need is the January 1st, 2023, which it was, that their organizations needed to be sending a 3-5 file and not a 3-4 file. Right, right. And that's in column B, right? No. Right. Oh, so I, this is Samantha, and I think um, I, I agree with, with Keenan's point here. The 3-5 transition timeframe column is great for us to know when the state can accept. What we as vendors also need to know as we're planning our timeframe is when all of our agencies in that state need to be moved over to 3-5. It's not on the day they start accepting. Um, in this case, I, I think you're onto something, Clay. Maybe we just change the, this column title to last day to accept 3-4 or... Um, you know, there is a penalty for still being on 3-4 at this point in time, because that's kind of what's happening in Colorado, right? It's, they technically can accept 3-4. They don't, uh, their regulatory mandate is everyone needs to be on 3-5. So it, it, to me, for Colorado, it should be last day to accept 3-4. Really what are, everyone should be on 3-5 was January 1st, 2023. Colorado shouldn't be TBD on, on 3-4, I don't think, for last day to accept. Right, right. And then, yeah, and then to um, uh, to Amber's point, they're, they're going to be soft on that, right? Because, because people are going to be transitioning for, not everybody's going to make that deadline or did make that deadline. So, yeah. We'll, we'll talk about it internally. I, we just are really mindful about how often we survey the states. So to add a whole nother column to this spreadsheet is a whole is a whole nother survey to every state and help them to understand the difference between last day to accept three, four, hard cutover dates, regulatory requirements. That's a lot of detailed communication that the source of truth will always be the state and not, not, uh, not the spreadsheet that we can only update occasionally. Yeah, and maybe, maybe I could just ask, use this venue really quickly to ask the vendors, maybe I could just answer the last day to accept three, four differently. And maybe what I should be answering there is 12, 31, 2022. Um, because that, that was the last time it was acceptable to send us three, four. Now I'm not turning away three, four records, but maybe that's a more clear way to communicate um, with the vendors on the call that that is that, that switch over date. Would that help? I think that would help us for sure, because um, we look at that date to determine, you know, where in the range we can schedule this so that we are um, giving the providers the right amount of time, as well as our implementation team the right amount of time to to do this if we have a whole bunch of states going at the same time. So I, I would prefer that personally. Okay, hindsight is twenty twenty, but other states can learn from my mistakes. Are there any other state data managers that are on the call that that uh, have the same type of questions or or want to ask the vendors the same same type of thing that Amber just did? Um, this is Anne in Arizona. <laughs> uh, I have kind of a similar question. I put in the chat too. Like I totally get what Amber's saying, and like for example, our drop dead date for switching to three five is before July 1st, 2023. Is everyone going to make it? I don't know. Um, and then we have to decide what are we going to do? We can still take records, some are, you know, regulatory issues. So it does get complicated when you get closer to, I mean, when we went from two to three, we did stop taking um, V2 records at one point, you know, because it was just, it, you can't just have that extend on for eons. But um, but I get what Keenan's saying too, or at least like what I think he's saying is kind of like 
if we're telling the agencies they need to transition by a date, that's what those agencies are going to be anticipating. That's what they're going to be telling their vendor. And they're not really, if they see that date, that's the date they're going to want their vendor to have the ability to move them over before. And that would probably be their customer's expectation. So maybe that's why that matters. And I just said, you know, if you want to put like an asterisk or something, I don't know if it would be at the top of the column, like just next to it, but kind of like, you know, there, there probably are for most states, some sort of um, long, longer explanation that we can't put here. And everybody has slightly different things that would happen if you don't. I know in our state, we've gotten questions and it's not a short answer, like kind of like contact, you know, link it to the state so that they can contact the state data manager with questions. Um, I think this is one of the reasons we are so hesitant to add this column to this spreadsheet in the first place um, was this very thing. It's really hard to define with each state having different parameters set on how they're going to end accepting three, four, when they're going to accept is it soft? Is it hard? Is it this? It, and so to have the column here that looks like it's a hard date, it, that's why we always refer the vendors, the, the agencies that contact us, please communicate with your state data managers because every state is different. And, and it really is hard to, to put the asterisk because the asterisk is gonna mean something different for everybody. And I was just going to ask you, but I saw at the bottom you have another tab because my thing too is I need to know for the software vendors, not only are when, but when are they ready, ready, not compliant necessarily. That's obviously important, but there's, I mean, I, this is not a, I'm not trying to be negative, just there's usually a difference between compliance and a, a product that the agencies are pretty happy with using uh, with all the features that they whatever they feel like their customers would want to have before they move over. At least we found that out when we moved from two to three with uh, a lot of agencies were like, yeah, I could move, but not, then I'd have to kind of go back in time and not be able to do all the things I want to be able to. So that would be something too, is it's not just when they're compliant. Cause I do watch that, but when are they ready to really like, they're like, okay, yep, we got this. It's, it's field ready. It's not something where there's going to be this, implosion potentially um and also are they really are they ready to roll it out like are they uh i keep going back to zol because keenan was talking before but kind of like you know if, if zol had to roll it out in our state by um, march i'm not moving the date like can they or you know do we need to have like a sidebar conversation I guess I could contact everybody all the time, but then all the states might end up contacting the vendors all the time. And it is nice to have one central bit of information in one place. So one thing I would, I would throw in about that is, in addition to being you know field ready and billing ready and reporting ready and documentation ready, um, is are we also, do we have everything we need for all the custom elements and are they also included? So it's kind of hard to, um, quantify that because it's going to change for each state um, as a vendor. That was that was also going to be my answer. Um, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Anne. Um, is we we have to triage, right? We have to triage which states go when, um, and which customers go when, and we have to spread that across the fifty plus uh, states and territories and the thousands of customers. So um, as we do that, uh, we look at the time, we also look at the weight and um, uh, level of effort for the specific custom elements for that state. Because I just remember, sorry, this is Anne again, with version two, so I always go back to that because that was a pretty big change. It was bigger than this change, but it's the closest thing I have to liken it to. Um, I think I, I won't say which vendor, but I thought it was a really valid point when I was asking why they couldn't have their, you know, agencies moved over. And they said, hey, you know, we have to prioritize the states where it is in rule required, could affect their license. We have to prioritize those agencies in our timeline, especially if the timeline is compressed over states that set a deadline, but there isn't any, I don't say any teeth to it. 
but it makes sense. I mean, if one agency is going to lose their license in, I don't know, Nebraska, I'm making that up. I don't know how their rules work. And they're not going to an Arizona and they don't have the capacity to do implementation for everybody at the same time. Um, that's what happened with version two and to three. And I would think that that could happen in any version change. Um, and that's kind of what I mean. I mean, I know that's like a probably more in depth than this table would be, but that really matters. I need to know, like, I tell my agencies, I don't know if they listen, but I say, call your vendor now. Like I said, in October, get a hold of them now. Find out if there's like, you have to get in line or what the process is, get your dates down. But I'm sure that most of them don't. And that's what really matters is if I'm pushing the agencies to make a date and they can't make it because their vendor cannot accommodate them. Once again, no criticism. Uh, I'm going to have a, some irritated stakeholders that are then going to be kind of vocal. And that's the kind of thing I would like to avoid. I'd like to know and just have that relationship with the vendor and not have to basically have agencies call my bureau chief. Does that make sense? I think it makes perfect sense. I'm not sure there's anything that we could add to a spreadsheet. Like we can talk about it um, with the team in, internally and, and see, but I don't, again, it's one of those things that's so nuanced. I don't know how we could possibly um, keep track or or have them keep something up to date. Um, it, it would be, it would be quite the rock to push up the mountain. And I don't know how we do it and make sure that, you know, we're not in any way impeding the vendor's relationship with their customers. That, that That's also a, a, a piece of it. And Jen, if I could tack onto that as well, I think these calls are a really great forum for states to bring up those those nuances and the things that are specific to them. The states have a really great access to almost all the vendors on this call. So even if during open forum on this call, you want to come off mute or put it into chat, hey, our state is requiring this, or this is sp something specific, you know, please ask questions or reach out if you've got a question. Um, these, these calls are a really great um, venue for those discussions. Um, even if it's even if it's just a hey, if you operate a product in my state, please reach out to me and I'll send you what our specifics are. Um, you know, it just it's a good it's a good connector. Um, and Jen, there was um, a question in chat about um, doesn't compliant if a product is compliant and passes compliant, shouldn't that mean that they are field ready? Do you want to talk about um, Talk about that for just a minute. I do. So, so I also want to say, um, if you don't know um, your vendors or you need some contact information for your vendors to the state data managers, please reach out. We're more than happy to share the contact information if if you don't know it. So, um, and vendors, if you're not sure who to contact in a state, it's on the state page, or you know, um, please reach out as well. For compliance and field readiness, we do look at it, but we do not, you know, comment or or look at the flow necessarily, right? Or um, we we make sure that the elements are there, we make sure the fields are there, but we don't necessarily make sure that if you've marked primary impression as a cardiac arrest, it flows to the cardiac cardiac arrest section. And I know that has a lot to do with the field readiness. Um, during compliance, the custom elements that they are tested on are national custom elements at this time. So each state having their own custom elements, that's not, we don't look state by state to make sure that they have all the different states' custom elements. Um, so that's a, a part that, that we don't um, look at on the compliance specific to a state. Um, they, it has to be able to collect everything. It has to be able to send everything to the receive and process vendor and receive and process vendors have to be able to send it to the Nemesis tech. Um, and, but very, very specific as far as the look of a product or the flow of a product, we don't, we don't test that. 
and and we wouldn't be able to because then it would be scoring the different software products and and we don't do that. Did that answer the question or um, did I miss the mark? No, that answered the question. It, she she just said that the the software was going to blow up, and if it's going to blow up, I didn't I didn't think that would be compliant. Oh yes, yeah, no. <laughs> um, did I miss any other questions, Julian? It's hard to track the chat, and so I apologize if I've missed anything. Um, I believe Josh, are you on with us today? Yes, I am. Fantastic. So I'm going to stop sharing if you need to share your screen. Yeah, um, sounds good. Josh is going to give us an update on the interoperability. Great. Let me get my screen sharing going here. Um, I'm going to throw this uh, up on the screen to share, which I will get to in just a minute. Um, but uh, it'll give you a chance to be checking out those dates and jotting them down <clears throat> for upcoming uh, task force meetings for interoperability. Um, so uh, as you probably know, we've been working with integrating the healthcare enterprise or IHE USA uh, over the past uh, seven months or so um, to uh, improve interoperability of data between EMS and the rest of healthcare. IHE hosted a uh, a part of one of their digital series uh, events uh, a couple of weeks ago in January. And that included a live uh, listening session one morning that was about 90 minutes long. They had some great discussion. Um, John Murkey from IHE uh, gave an overview of the document sharing infrastructure, kind of how documents get shared um, between different healthcare data systems, uh, what the standards are that are used for those um, interactions. Uh, talked about the Consolidated Clinical Document Architecture, or CCDA, which is um, in HL7 version 3. It's an XML-based uh, standard, um, so that a lot of documents are in that format. Uh, also newer to the scene is the International Patient Summary, which uh, has been designed for HL7 FHIR architectures. Um, so th there was some discussion around those things. And then lots of uh, just back and forth discussion and questions and things from those who were uh, in that listening session that really um, uh, hit on um, all of the topics that we have identified that we need to work on uh, in EMS interoperability. <clears throat> and so um, we're going to be working through those topics uh, kind of, it, you know, one at a time, we're going to chew through them. Um, the... I'd say one the the issue we've had in this project is um, getting the ad, enough advanced planning so that we can get dates out to all of you that you could actually get on your calendars more than a week in advance. And um, so we're trying to solve that issue by putting on dates for the rest of this calendar year for the EMS interoperability task force. These will be in addition to the other things that are going on, like the IHE Connectathon or the uh, um, interoperability showcase at the HIMSS conference in April or the IHE digital series events. These will be a monthly task force meeting where we're working on some stuff. Uh, so there will be some information sharing and presentations from experts, but then lots of time for discussion and kind of uh, really chewing on it and saying, okay, you know, how do we make this apply to EMS? How do we make it work in the EMS environment? So that's what we're going to be doing through this task force. Um, we've, I've listed the dates here on this flyer that I'm sharing, and this flyer is going to go out uh, to the Nemesis Google group um, today after this call. Uh, so monthly meeting uh, on the second Thursday of each month, except that uh, in February, it'll be on February 16th, which is next Thursday, uh, from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Mountain Time. And... Um, the first topic that we're going to cover in the February meeting is identifying data exchange partners and establishing relationships. So this is going to be a topic around, um, you know, how does eHealth Exchange and Commonwealth and all of these national networks, how do they all fit in the big picture? And as a vendor or as an agency or as a state, 
how do you get connected to one of these national networks to then have that connection to you know the thousands of hospitals around the country? Um, so that's the topic for February. Really, you know, where are those relationships uh, established? And then we're gonna uh, from there we'll we'll um, kind of chip our way through the rest of these topics that are listed here on the flyer. Um, again, all of which had come up on this listening session a couple of weeks ago and things, there's issues we need to address in each of these topics to make e EMS interoperability uh, a real like daily routine kind of thing. The um, task force meetings will be hosted using the same Zoom link as this Nemesis V3 implementation call. So you should all be familiar with that Zoom link. And we're going to start up um, a Google group for email communications specific to this task force so that we don't uh, overwhelm the general Nemesis Google group. So if you are interested in keeping track of what we're doing with the interoperability efforts, then uh, I encourage you to uh, uh, get your email address listed onto that uh, Google group so that you can um, get the updates that we send out. So in a second, I will uh, post the, the link for that um, in the chat on this call. Um, but look forward to seeing many of you on February 16th to talk about this, um, these national networks and, and how you um, can get connected with them. Uh, any questions on what we're doing with interoperability? So is this going to be amongst our cells from the EMS side or who's joining from, is from IHE that is joining? Yes, both. So we, we'd like to have lots of uh, EMS software vendors as well as some state and agency representation. And then IHE is inviting people who, um, who know something about the subject. So that'll change, you know, from month to month, but uh, uh, they're inviting someone from eHealth Exchange uh, to, um, to be on the call in February. Okay, thanks everyone. All right, thanks Josh. Um, Next on the agenda, we have Julianne asking a question um, and we're hoping to get another good conversation going like the one we just had. Thank you, Jen. Um, and I don't have anything to share. It really just is um, a question to put to put to put to this group as you are um, our state and vendor subject matter experts. We had a request from one of our state data managers come into the TAC to ask if we were aware of any um, states or areas uh, that have had successful uh, connection with the UUID associated with 3-5 records in connecting with their hospitals for trauma registry products. Um, I know there we have several states that are collecting 3-5 records. Um, so many agencies have transitioned to 3-5 the 3-5 standard, but we wanted to put it out to this group if any of you are willing to share um, your experience in connecting with your hospital um, or your trauma registry products in utilizing the UUID for that uh, connection. Um, if you have an experience or if you're you're trying to, you know, you're you're making progress in that arena, we'd love for you to share. Um, best practices or yep, we're it it's working, we're doing it. It's you know, um, any any feedback that you might have to share with the states on how to facilitate uh, great linkage with those um, trauma registry products at the hospital with the UUID. Feel free to come off mute or to um, put it in the chat. We just, and we'll probably ask this a few times throughout the year as um, more and more states and agencies are implementing 3.5 and um, utilizing that UUID um, component of 3.5.
And thanks for bringing that up and um, putting in the in the chat um, that Arizona is not connecting yet. Um, and you're just not quite sure where the trauma registry vendors are um, for that exchange function. Okay. And we know uh, we know some of the vendors on the call have trauma registry products. Um, so you're welcome to um, you're welcome to chime in if you have anything that you want to share with the states on how to best facilitate those connections. Jay, thanks for putting in the chat. The UUID is flowing from pre-hospital to our trauma registry. However, the users do not see this, but it does submit to the NTDB. Okay, so Jay, you've got that process that process flowing and Amber in Colorado. Okay, awesome. So for Jay, what version of the data dictionary are they using for the trauma registry? Is it 2023? Yes, we are on the 2023. Only um, records uh, in the EMS system from 2023 are sending the uh, UUID to the trauma system. Just if, if that uh, makes some stuff. So we started that uh, January 1st. Is that only direct data entry records, or is that also records that are imported? Because that may be a difference, too. To my knowledge, it will create a UUID on import. I'm going to have to test. I got a couple stragglers uh, on those imports, and uh, I'll have to double check on that. Part of the reason why I can't check on that is they are behind and not in compliance with submission of their data. So do you need to check stick? when they're behind. Do, do you need a stick, Jay? <laughs> well, I was going to think some like peanut butter fudge or maybe <laughs> bacon. I don't I'm out of carrots. If you need a stick, I'll send you one. <laughs> that is good to hear that that some folks are doing it successfully, though. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, that's really it's really exciting. It's such a huge. It's such a huge um, feature and benefit to 3.5. Okay, and Doug Butler with Image Trend, their patient registry product, and the chat just minimized, um, is accepting 3.5 UUID. Okay, excellent. Right. Did anyone else have anything to add before we move to the next item? Thanks, okay. you guys. And as you have experiences of success or struggle, please feel free to reach out to the TAC. We'd love to be able to highlight best practices or I wish I had done this, um, you know, with other state data managers that that are trying to, to make those connections as well. So we encourage you to share your success and your struggle so everyone can learn together. Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Best practices are one of the good things that, that come out once things get started so that those coming after don't have to do all the pitfalls or, or hardships that uh, you had to in the beginning. So, all right, the next item, uh, is, are there any items from the Office of EMS? Mr. Eric Cheney. Hey, good afternoon, all. I have just one, actually a request on looking for anyone who is collecting specific data on telemedicine, maybe above and beyond the existing um, NEMSIS data set or a community paramedicine program. Um, if you're doing that and you're, you're willing to share some of the experience, I, I would be very happy to listen. We've been asked to put together some information for a telemedicine uh, presentation that'll go to HHS. And basically I'm just looking for some, some background support uh, for existing efforts. Other than that, I have nothing specific uh, for, nothing specific for the group this morning, unless you have questions for me, I'm happy to address them. Hey, Eric, Lance Iverson from South Dakota put into the chat that South Dakota has a statewide telemedicine program free to all our ambulance services that started about a month ago. I just saw that. Excellent. I may reach out for some, some additional information, and uh, I see the one. Thank you, AVEL.
All right, so we're going to move into open forum. Are there any questions or items from discussion uh, for discussion that anyone on the call would like to, to start? I have kind of an awkward one. Uh, so we we got the documents for Illinois for Schematron 3.5, but it doesn't work. And Dan Lee is still listed as the data manager, even though he's left. And we're not sure who to talk to about the problems with the Schematron. So maybe it's open to, um, you know, if Image Trend provides support on the Schematron at that point, and that he there's a message on his saying to call the the call a phone number, but that's the phone number for the EMT licensing line, and they don't have any idea what I'm talking about. So I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's been a replacement for Dan Lee um, in Illinois. Yet, Lori, have you heard or or gotten any information about a replacement for Dan? I don't think there's a replacement, but I can look through some emails and I'll, David, I'll shoot you an email if I can find any contacts for you to reach out to. That'd be good. Uh, David, this is Josh with Biospatial. We're the state repository vendor for Illinois. Um, okay. You can send me an email. And we'll help answer any questions about the Schematron. While we did not develop that original Schematron, we helped them um, with the, the V3.5 version uh, and can help connect you to folks in IDPH for authoritative answers. That'd be great. Uh, could you shoot me the email on the chat or something? Sure. Thank you. So, Steve, um, you may want to grab Josh's email as well. Were there any other questions or or this is a, a great venue to ask those questions and, and seek out information uh, from state data managers or from vendors? Um, it's a it's a good chance. You have everyone's attention. So I have a problem here in Indiana. <clears throat> And I okay. emailed Jen about it ago just a little bit because I wasn't sure I wanted to bring it up on the phone call. But since you, that's what this is for, uh, here's the problem I'm experiencing in Indiana. And it's not to throw anybody under the bus as far as the state goes or the software vendors goes. But I'm having very low scores in my image trend site, uh, especially with the ESO software that we're using. When I talk to ESO about it, ESO says that it's the Schematron and that the Schematron isn't showing these fields as required and the state's deducting points for it. When I talk to the state about it, they don't seem to be real interested in creating a new Schematron. And I feel like they're just kind of shrugging their shoulders. But in the meantime, I've got charts that are scoring, you know, 30 points. It's got 40 points. It's got 50 points. Because I can't go in and make some of these fields mandatory in ESO for the crew members to have to complete them before they close their chart. And I just, I, it's led to complete frustration for me. And I'm at a point where I just really don't know what to do because nobody seems to want to do anything to help me, whether it's coming from the state or coming from the software vendors. Are they optional fields? According to the state, no, because they're taking points away from it. So on the Schematron, it's not showing as a required mandatory field on the Schematron, but the state's still deducting points if the crew members didn't fill that information out. And because it's not showing as a required mandatory field on the Schematron, ESO isn't going in, it won't go in and change anything to make it a required field. Hey, Michael, this is Samantha with ESO. Can you reach out to me directly? I sent you my email address and chat. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Did anyone else have any other questions or we can um, 
this is Lauren Wazol. I was wondering what other people's plans were with the state of Illinois, because before Dan left, it was encouraging all of the customers to get on. So some are anxious to do so, um, but without having the contact in place or having issues with the schematron, I'm pretty hesitant to do it on this side. So I'd like to see what other people are doing in regards to Illinois 3.5. We're uh, we're following the the three four zero the the three four zero of Schematron uh, back transited from three point five with the National Schematron. Thank you. This is Anne in Arizona. <laughs> um, I have a question um, regarding compliance. So partly because we're also accepting 3.5, I was keeping a closer eye on the compliance list than I normally maybe would. I checked it more often. Um, and I'm trying to keep track of my agencies, who's on 3.4, who's on 3.5, you know, all of that kind of as a big timeline. And I noticed that there was um, a software missing from 3.4 compliance, um, which is emergency reporting. And... Um, but I still have all of the same agencies submitting emergency reporting still. Thank and I'm not exactly, and I, and I, I don't, or, or they didn't change their name over when they're sending in a software um, name. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, this is Samantha with ESO. So um, ER was, uh, or ESO required ER. Um, we are in the process of moving everybody. Um, thought that I talked with you about this last year, maybe. <laughs> Possibly. If, if you did, I completely <laughs> have deleted that conversation. Um, but yeah, it was more just when I checked, I did a frequency and I'm like, yeah. I still have. So then I, I had contacted Nemesis just because then I was like, oh, crud, does that mean that those records aren't going to Nemesis? Because it's not comp so I didn't know how that whole process worked. And I and I I, I know they're discussing like and I don't know if there even is a policy, but it made me kind of think uh it's probably something that I need to touch base with somebody on and get that done or move those agencies to the three five product, you know, so they don't have to we, worry whatever it is. We are trying to move them off the ER product onto the EHR product. Um, and as we're doing that, we are converting them over to um to the compliance software. Uh, it is just a slow moving process, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but I'll, I can reach out to you and give you more information about our, our plans and timelines and um, get you in touch with the right people if you'd like. No, no, that would be great. And then if okay. you are, so I don't have to bug the agencies. If you already know what their timelines are, then I won't reach okay. out to them, also ask them and right. hopefully not. You know, it might help. <laughs> I'll move the process along. Really? Okay. Because I was like, I didn't want to alarm them where they think there's a, I just, it's yeah. not really something that we would normally continue to. Yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. set up a meeting okay. with you Thanks. and the, the group that's working on that. So, yeah. Thanks again, Sam. <laughs> All right. I think that was great discussion. Um, if there's anything else. Jen, just one quick alibi. Um, you know, this is the kind of discussion that I, I really appreciate having here. If there are concerns, and, and Michael, it appears to me you're not muted now, um, so don't say bad words. But uh, Michael, if you if you have problems or you have concerns like this, or you know, and um, we're certainly not the stick <laughs> with uh, with the vendors and such for you know forcing anybody's hand to make anything happen. That being said, I am happy to have Jen or Julianne or Clay coordinate a call with, with the people that need to be on it to kind of mediate moving things forward in a state or assisting with conflict in a state as kind of that mini UN type of position. Um, so if, if that becomes an issue, please don't let it fester. Please don't let it become a big issue. We're happy to to pull in everybody and, and kind of mediate for you. So just keep that in mind as you move forward.
Thank you, Eric. All right, this was great discussion today. Thank, thank everybody for, for sharing, contributing. Like I said at the beginning, if you have the question or the comment or concern, there's at least one other person on this call that has the same. So this was great. Um, please know that our next upcoming meeting is February 22nd, same time, same place. We will send out the agenda prior to the meeting. And I want to thank you all for your participation. Um, we all know that you're everyone is extremely busy. And so taking this time out to have these calls um, is important and, and valuable. Uh, thank you very much. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.